Hey everybody, welcome to the Shanty. As you can see, it is a fabulous Thanksgiving Day Shanty podcast. Thanksgiving's next week. For those of you who know me and have ever seen me from more than here up, you know that I'm a big fan of eating, and since Thanksgiving is all about eating, I know that's not really what it's all about, but that's certainly what it's become in this day and age. Uh, it's my favorite holiday. I love Thanksgiving because I get to eat and then fall asleep watching the Lions lose a football game, and who could ask for anything more than that on a Thursday afternoon? So we're going to have a little Thanksgiving Day shanty today, and the Thanksgiving Day shanty is going to be on the OSHA ETS, Emergency Temporary Standard. Now here's what we're not going to talk about. We are not going to talk about Executive Order 14042, which is the federal contractor mandate. And we are not going to talk about the earlier OSHA ETS that was issued for the healthcare industry. And we are not even going to talk about the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services order that was issued right at the same time that this ETS was issued that covers people who get money from Medicare and Medicaid. We're not going to talk about those things. We're going to talk about the ETS that applies generally to most employers in the United States that employ 100 or more employees. All right. So you will recall that back in September, President Biden did his path out of the pandemic memorandum, and in that he ordered OSHA to issue an ETS on COVID vaccination in the workplace. OSHA then took a month to draft this thing, sent it to OMB, the Office of Management and Budget, which is the step before publishing it. They approved it. And then on the 4th of November, both the White House and OSHA announced this ETS, and it has a number of requirements in it. It was published in the Federal Register and became effective on November 5th. Now, the, OSHA, the, the ETS has got two deadlines in it, as you will recall from our webinar. There's a December 6th deadline and a January 4th deadline. You have to have some things done by the 6th of December. And then on the 4th of January, that's when the meat of this thing kicks in. And all employees at a covered employer must either be vaccinated or they must submit to weekly COVID testing based on the details in the ETS. We're not going to talk about any of those details today. What we're going to talk about is where the ETS is right now legally. All right. So what happened? Well, on the 6th of November, the day after this thing was issued, the lawsuit started a filing and they, they got filed ultimately there were lawsuits filed in 12 circuit court of appeals uh, by 34 different sets of plaintiffs. Okay, some of them got consolidated, but we ultimately ended up with lawsuits in 12 different courts of appeals. Now, those of you that are nerds about stuff like this will know that I said lawsuits were filed in circuit courts of appeals. That's not the way it normally works. Usually what happens is the lawsuit gets filed in a district court. The district court hears it. It gets appealed to a circuit court. The circuit court heals, hears it, and then ultimately, maybe, it goes to the Supreme Court of the United States. That's not the case here. Because this these lawsuits are challenging a an, an agency order, you are allowed to file your lawsuit directly in a circuit court of appeals and bypass the district court. Now, the you're allowed to do that in any circuit in which there is an aggrieved person or where an aggrieved person has their principal place of business. So we ended up getting lawsuits filed in a lot of, almost all of them, uh, the Circuit Courts of Appeals, 12 of them, 34 different lawsuits. Now, there's when that happens, in order to avoid a bunch of different results, 34 different lawsuits, 12 Courts of Appeals, how many results? There is this thing called the Judicial Panel for Multi-District Litigation. And that statute, law, allows these kinds of cases, uh, although there's some argument as to whether this is an appropriate case, we, we don't worry about that because they did it, so it doesn't matter. Um, to consolidate those challenges in a single circuit court, when, as, in, as is the case here, multiple challenges are filed in at least two courts of appeals, within 10 days after the agency issues the order, then the agency has to go to this multi-judicial panel, in this case OSHA, and say, we've got a bunch of different lawsuits filed. We need them consolidated. And you're not going to believe how they do this, but they do it by lottery. They then hold a lottery to determine which circuit court 
is going to ultimately decide these issues. And I say ultimately, I mean at the circuit court level, because ultimately we all know the Supreme Court of the United States is going to decide this issue before we're all done. But they do a lottery, and literally a lottery. They can put the circuit court names on ping pong balls and throw them in a barrel, and the clerk of the court picks one out, and that's the circuit that gets it. Lo and behold, the circuit that got it was our very own Sixth Circuit. Now, is that good or is that bad? Depends on which side of the issue you're on, for one thing. And the, the Sixth Circuit tends to be a little conservative. Uh, but they're not as conservative as, say, the Fifth Circuit is. And we're going to talk about the Fifth Circuit in a minute. And they are certainly more conservative than, say, the Ninth Circuit is. So maybe someplace in the middle? I don't know. There's more Republican-appointed judges in the Sixth Circuit than there are Democratic-appointed judges. But I think you can overestimate what that means. My hope is that a panel of judges will be, a panel of three judges will be appointed to hear this case. They will look at the law and they'll make a decision based on the law. And that's the way judges are supposed to do this stuff. And I have complete faith in the judiciary and think that's what they will do here. So anyway, this is now consolidated in the Sixth Circuit. In the meantime, and before all that happened, the next day, the Fifth Circuit on the 6th issued a, t a stay of the OSHA ETS. Now, how, how can they do that? Well, because the same law that provides for this multi-jurisdictional panel also allows any circuit court where a court is heard, uh, is where a, any, let's try again, any circuit court where a lawsuit is filed to act on that lawsuit pending the assignment of the case. All right? Um, and they can decide on AG, agency action pending the consolidation. That's what the Fifth Circuit did. And they issued a stay. And they issued a stay, and all they said was, is a very short stay, that said, we think there are grave statutory and constitutional issues, so we're staying the agency action. And they ordered expedited briefing. The government had to file a brief, and then the plaintiffs got to file a reply brief. And that was done in very short order. The government had until Monday. The um, plaintiffs had until Tuesday. The briefs were filed, and then the court issued an opinion. And in this case, on the 12th of November, they issued a 10-page opinion that walked through a four-factor test for determining whether or not a stay was appropriate. Think of stay like an injunction, all right? And that four-factor test involved whether or not they thought the plaintiffs were going to succeed on the merits, what the harm to the plaintiffs would be if there was no stay, what the harm to the other side, in this case the government, OSHA, would be if there was a stay, and what the public interest was. And the Fifth Circuit, in their 10-page opinion, found that a stay was appropriate. They said that it was highly likely that the plaintiffs were going to succeed on the merits. They said that the plaintiffs would be significantly harmed if there was no stay, because they could either lose their jobs or they'd have to get a shot or subject themselves to testing. They said that OSHA wasn't going to be harmed at all. I mean, after all, it took OSHA two months to get this thing in place. What's well, another month or two while the courts figure it out? And they said that the public interest clearly weighed in favor of a stay. Now, what the meat of the opinion was success on the merits. That's where all of it came. And the court really looked at two issues. First of all, they looked at OSHA's authority to do this, and they said, for a number of reasons that we're not going to go into, that they didn't believe OSHA had the authority to issue this ETS. And they did that based on a statutory basis. Now, they didn't, they didn't, they said, we don't have to reach the constitutional issues, but then they talked about them anyway, because courts do that often. They say, ah, we don't have to reach those constitutional issues, but even if we did, we find in favor of the plaintiffs in this case. But they did this basically based on statutory issues, looking, interestingly enough, at the position of the private parties in the lawsuit, not the states like Texas and South Carolina and some of the other states that were in this. And, and they issued an order on the 12th, and it said two things. After all the 10 pages and all the explanation of why, they said that the stay the, or the agency action remains stayed pending adequate judicial review of the petitioner's underlying motions for a permanent injunction. In other words, we're going to issue this temporary injunction until the courts can fully decide this issue. Okay, fair enough. And then the other thing they said is, it is further ordered that OSHA take no steps to implement or enforce the mandate until further court order. 
That stops OSHA from doing anything. Now, if there was any question at all as to whether a Fifth Circuit stay operated in the Sixth Circuit or the Ninth Circuit or the Second Circuit or any other circuit, that part of the order is an attempt to take care of that. They're saying to OSHA, you can't do anything about this. Don't do anything. OSHA has accepted that result. They went on their website, their Emergency Temporary Standard website, yesterday or the day before, I can't remember, and they issued a statement. And they put the statement on their website, and it says this. On November 12, 2021, the U.S. Court of Appeals for the Fifth Circuit granted a motion to stay OSHA's COVID-19 vaccination testing ETS, blah, blah, blah. The court ordered that OSHA, quote, take no steps to implement or enforce, end quote, the ETS, quote, until further court order, end quote. And then OSHA said this. While OSHA remains confident of its authority to protect workers in emergencies. Interesting choice of language, don't you think? OSHA has suspended activities related to the implementation and enforcement of the ETS pending future developments in the litigation. Now, I know what you're all asking. What does that mean for us? Are we going to get more time? And the answer is, I don't know. But that's a better indication that you're going to get more time than just the court order was. OSHA could have just said, go on. But we don't know if we're going to get more time, which means what should we be doing? And that's a fabulous question. The question now is, what do we do? Do we do something? Do we continue to move forward toward compliance? And it might be a wise idea to do that um, because there's some stuff in this order, as you know, that's going to take some work. Uh, and it's going to take some work to get it done. It was going to take some work to get it done by December 6th anyway, let alone waiting two weeks or three weeks and then getting it done. So let's think about the things that you might want to still be doing while we decide how all this is going to play out and what the Sixth Circuit is going to ultimately do with this. Some of the stuff, some of the stuff that had to be done by the Sixth was, number one, you had to determine the vaccination status of each of your employees. Now, you had a right to do that before the CTS was put in place. You might want to continue to do it to think about doing it. If you haven't done it, you might want to do it. And that's especially true if you have lots and lots of employees. If you've got five or 600 employees and you have no idea what their vaccination status is, you might want to get started on that. It's not going to hurt if the thing goes away and it will help if it doesn't go away. The other thing you have to, had to do was get a policy in place, one or the other. And you might want to continue to do that too. Um, and if you need a policy, by the way, we have a policy that complies with the ETS and we have it available for a fixed fee. And so call one of us and we'll be happy to do that. But there's some other stuff going on that I want you to think about um, while we're talking about this. So if you have unions, if you don't have unions, you can, I don't know, ignore me. Uh, go grab a snack and come back in a couple of seconds and we'll talk about the end of this. You can do whatever you want. But if you do have unions, listen up. Because on November 10th, the General Counsel of the National Labor Relations Board issued a GC memo, which he's issued a ton of, directed at the ETS. And it's entitled Responding to Inquiries Regarding Bargaining Obligations Under the Department of Labor's Emergency Temporary Standard to Protect Workers from Coronavirus. It's GC Memo 22-03, issued on November 10th, 2021. Now, the memo says a couple of things about your bargaining obligations if you have a union. First of all, the GC takes the position that any covered employer would normally have a decisional bargaining obligation regarding any aspect of the ETS that affects terms and conditions of employment. What's the most obvious of that? The policy, right? But the GC also acknowledged in the memo, hey, look, if the policy is required by law, you don't have to bargain over the decision to implement the policy. Sounds good, right? Wait just a minute. Unless the law gives you discretion. If you have discretion about implementing the policy, then the GC is saying you need to bargain with your union over that policy because it is a term or condition of employment and you have discretion about what you're going to do. In this case, the ETS gives you discretion. You have two choices of policies. You could either have a mandatory vaccination policy or you can have a vaccination plus testing and face mask wearing policy. 
Now, I know most of you are going to want to implement the testing policy and not the mandatory vaccination policy because you don't want to lose people. And I understand that. But what the GC is saying here is that you have to sit down and bargain with your union over the decision of whether or not you want to implement that policy. Who knows? Maybe your union is going to want a mandatory vaccine policy. In fact, a lot of unions filed lawsuits against this very ETS claiming it didn't go far enough. Now, they did that so they could get more liberal courts in the lottery. Don't kid yourself for a minute. But they did it. So you've got a decisional bargaining obligation over that. The other thing the GC memo says is that you have also have what's called an effects bargaining obligation over the parts of the ETS that you don't have discretion on. So if the ETS requires you to do something, you have to bargain with the union over what the effect of that is on the employees. Not the decision to do it, but the effect to do it. We also see this often see this in plant closing situations. You have the authority to close a plant, but you have to bargain with the union over the effects of closing the plant, and usually that means paying some severance. In this case, it means, let's say we have an employee who fails a test. What are we going to do with them? How long do they stay? You know, that sort of stuff. So if you have unions, you might want to think about sitting down with your union now and talking about some of these things and come to maybe some provisional conclusions about what you want to do. Now, if you have any questions about this at all, if you need a policy, if you want to talk to us about this, please don't hesitate to give one of us a call. And we'll be happy to walk through it with you, whether it's the ETS or whether it's your bargaining obligations under the ETS. We'll be happy to talk to you about it. The other thing I, again, want to stress is that if you are covered by one of the other orders, the federal contractor order, the Medicare Medicaid order, those are being challenged in court. But in my opinion, they have a, those lawsuits have a much less likelihood of succeeding than this particular lawsuit does, which I think has a pretty good chance that it's going to ultimately be overturned. Now, that's just my personal opinion, um, I, but and we'll see what the Sixth Circuit does, but that's where we sit now. Hope you enjoyed this. Hope you have a fabulous and fun-filled Thanksgiving. I uh, hope you can get together with your family and your friends, and we'll see you next time after the holiday.